I'm Ted Kaufman, Chair of the Congressional Oversight Panel. I'm here to introduce our February report, Executive Compensation Restrictions in the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Since long before the 2008 financial crisis, the pay of CEOs and other top corporate officers has sparked controversy and debate. If you've ever negotiated your own salary, you know the challenge of measuring your worth to a company. Negotiations for top executives are vastly more complex, as they are paid in ways that most of us never consider, with stock, restricted stock, stock options, loans, incentive payments, access to a company car, jet, and much, much more. Experts do agree that an executive's pay should reflect his or her contributions to the company and should avoid encouraging the executives to take excessive risks but there's little agreement on how to achieve this in practice. Congress joined this debate in dramatic fashion when it authorized a $700 billion troubled asset relief program to rescue the financial system and subsequently impose sweeping restrictions on executive pay for TARP recipients. In essence, Congress said that taxpayer money comes with strings attached. Companies that take public dollars must reform their pay practices to ensure that taxpayers recover their money the CEOs are held accountable for their performance, and that they help stabilize the economy. Treasury established two new offices to oversee these compensation restrictions, the Office of Internal Review and the Office of the Special Master for Executive Compensation. The Office of Internal Review has attracted less public attention because its role is more modest. It only certifies compliance with executive compensation restrictions rather than actively setting pay. Even so, it oversees the activities of hundreds of banks and other recipients of taxpayer money, and the panel's concern that the office has not released a single public document explaining its work. The office's special master, by contrast, was highly visible and made its determinations public. Its job was daunting, to set executive compensation for seven institutions that received exceptional taxpayer assistance, AIG, Citigroup, Bank of America, and the major auto manufacturers and their financing affiliates. Amidst intense media scrutiny and in a time of deep public anger, Special Master achieved some significant changes at the institutions under his review. Most notably, overall compensation at the companies under the Special Master's jurisdiction fell by an average of 55 percent, and cash compensation was generally limited to $500,000. The special master also shifted compensation to emphasize stock. This was an important reform. It tied executives' own financial future to their firm, firm's performance, encouraging them to think long and hard about the wisdom of their decisions. By requiring executives to hold stock for up to four years, the special master also encouraged executives to take a longer view of their company's success. Even so, the panel has several concerns about the pay packages approved by the special master. For example, although stock-based compensation has important merits, it also creates real risks, including the possibility that executives might gamble their company's future in hopes of boosting the value of their pay. Further, the special master's pay package took a one-size-fits-all approach meaning that the pay packages of an auto executive and a Wall Street CEO were structured very similar. It's not clear why or whether this was the correct approach. Consider that cash compensation at all firms was generally capped at $500,000, but the half a million dollars goes much, much further in Detroit than in New York City. A separate concern is the special master's look-back review of payments to executives at TARP recipients prior to February 17, 2009. Congress tasked the special master to seek appropriate reimbursements for any payments made contrary to the public interest. Ultimately, he found $1.7 billion in payments to be disfavored and not necessarily appropriate, but not inconsistent with the public interest. This is a distinction that only a lawyer could love. By drawing such a fine line, the special master may have avoided lengthy and disruptive public fight over clawbacks, but he may also have performed an end run around his guidance from Congress. Further, he may have created the impression that the government condoned wrongful compensation 
to executives who had contributed to the financial crisis. Finally, the special master should be judged in part by the goal he set for himself to, and I quote, lay the groundwork for appropriate compensation structures at all financial institutions, unquote. Whatever the special master's accomplishments, the office fell far short of permanently reforming Wall Street pay practices. Indeed, it would be impossible for a corporate compensation expert to replicate the special master's work, as his decisions were essentially a black box to the public. What outside companies did, he considered as comparisons when settling executive pay. Why those companies? Which factors did he weight most heavily in setting pay at a particular institution? In many cases, the public simply doesn't know. Wall Street pay is rebounding to record highs, and experts judge the special master's influence as minimal. To the extent that greater transparency and clearer explanations could have influenced Wall Street, the special master's work represents a missed opportunity. What seemed an opportunity for sweeping reform now appears likely to leave a far more modest legacy. You can read the full report and offer your own views by visiting our website, cop.senate.gov.